When I was writing my book, most of the essays fit into clear territories. Sex, love, work, friendship. But then there are those subjects, vague but just as essential. Death, illness, mental health, the paranormal, right and wrong and good and bad. If your brain were a pie chart, this is the stuff that might not find a neat slice to settle itself into, but it's also the stuff that keeps you up at night, is impossible to explain, and makes you the complex and universally attuned individual you are. Welcome to the big picture. I want to be a, pediat a pediatrician. At the same time, I want to be a, a veterinarian, and then I also want to be a painter. But I also want to be like um, a curandera, which is like a healer with like natural plants. But then I was all oh, I was also thinking of of being a, a marine biologist, maybe, or like a person who studies like like strong diseases and how to cure them. Lupita Martinez is 11 years old. Not only does she have a lot of badass ideas about what she wants to be when she grows up, but she's already making a huge difference in her community in East Oakland, California. Her unofficial scouting troop, the Radical Monarchs, never even considered selling cookies. Instead, they're forging relationships in their community in radical new ways. One of my favorite parts of being a Radical Monarch is just building a lot of relationships with my with, with my radical monarch sisters and just learning with them is just like really fun. Hi, my name is Lupita and I'm in sixth grade and I'm 11 years old and I'm a part of the radical monarchs. Oh yeah, my mom started the group. She was, you know, at the end of her fourth grade year and really kind of like I saw her kind of grappling with like issues of her own identity. Like what does it mean for her to be this like young brown girl of color? So my name is Anevet Martinez and I am one of the co-founders of the radical monarchs. And so I started to think about what would it look like to start a group that centered her identity and that still had some of the components of like scouting troops, right, where they earn badges. But instead of earning badges for volunteering, like maybe at like a dog shelter, it was more based on social justice, like radical actions, like marches and um, learning about, you know, issues around identity and social justice. And so I um, asked one of my best friends, Marilyn, she has an extensive background with like youth development and youth work. And so I was kind of like, I have this idea. What do you think? And she was like, yes, we need this. I wish I would have had it. When are we going to do it? Let's do it. My name is Marilyn Hollenquist, and I am one of the co-founders of the Radical Monarchs. We hadn't seen anything that was social justice focused in an explicit way in an unapologetic like we're here we're earning like our radical pride badges or our pachamama justice badges we're constantly thinking about like so who do we need to bring in like who's whose voices do they not hear enough of and who do they get like who do they hear about all the time one of my favorite activities we went to trans march and we were allies to the ELA group, which is um, an organization for trans Latinas. And we were being allies to them. We were marching with them. And I thought it was really fun supporting them and yelling into the big mega, the megaphone. I said, uh, by accident. <laughs> and it was really loud. My name is Namik Salu. I am 11 years old, and I am a part of the Radical Monarchs. We wrote letters to Nicole, she's a transgender woman in jail. And it was fun decorating them because we got to use glitter. A lot of glitter. We tell them, like, when you earn a badge, it's not like, oh, okay, the work here's done, that was fun. It's like it's ongoing and it's, it's all layered. We met some of the members of the Black Panthers. And that was really cool because they gave us our badges and we got to shake their hands. We don't sugarcoat things with our girls, you know, we're very real. And, and I think this troop was very much informed by like these um, social movements from the past, like the Black Panther Party movement and the Brown Beret movement, and the Chicano movement, all these movements. And yet we know that there was also some pitfalls in those movements. And we're very real about that. And so I love that the girls like asked, you know, the Black Panther, like they were like, you know, what was it like to be a woman in the movement? And were there times where you felt like things weren't fair because you're a woman? Because we noticed that like, because we had them watch the video and they're like, we noticed that like there was no, not that many women in the video and the women were always behind the men. And, and you know, and I was like, right, that's right. Let's talk about that. For the Radical Beauty Batch, we also made um, lip balm and it was really fun and it smelled good. 
you don't have to ha use makeup or lip gloss or anything fancy with with chemicals to make you look younger or, or more beautiful. Our second unit was called Radical Beauty and that was all about like what does it mean to be radically beautiful? What does it mean to love yourself radically? You know, something that like we typically may not want to embrace but that makes us beautiful. You can, you're already beautiful and also it's just like some people they just believe that like makeup is the only thing that makes you beautiful but that's not true. Last week we met Betty who is this like 94 year old African-American park ranger woman who was um, alive during segregation and um, alive during the uh, Rosie Riveter era and talked a lot about like what that was like. We wanted them to learn about like who are all these other fierce women leaders that have been a, that are movement leaders, right? Um, so that was really powerful. When you're eight and seven, you're like, yes, girl power, it's awesome. And then and it's really well documented, you know, when you get to that like tween 11, 12, which is when you kind of start learning the like, oh, OK, it's not being a girl is not the best thing ever. I just wondered what would it be like if if all girls could skip that phase of not feeling good enough, not feeling like being a girl is awesome. What would that look like? If someone like recognizes you for something, you're like, what group are you called? You can be proud of saying, oh, I'm a radical monarch. And you could have like confidence in saying it. And I think it's really important also to be um, a radical monarch because communities that need the support from people that like do marches and do stuff with social justice, we're supposed to help them. And, and I really feel proud of that. And also, um, I just want to say to all my sisters, you guys are amazing. Oh yeah, you guys are like the bomb. You can go support the Radical Monarchs with their fundraising campaign at youcaring.com slash radical dash monarchs. Thanks to Katie J.M. Baker for initially reaching out to the Monarchs and coming up with some excellent questions. This episode is all about the big stuff, life writ large, and in keeping with that theme, Emma Stone and June Squibb, our trusted advisors, are here to share their answers to your toughest questions about friendship, relationships, work, bodies, and bucket lists. My grandfather passed a year ago. I never got along with him, so I wasn't saddened by his passing and didn't mourn. I felt guilty then, and I figured it would pass, but I just feel more guilty about not being upset. How do I come to terms with my feelings of guilt? It's hard when you're trying to force yourself to feel an emotion that you don't feel, but because they're family or because they're, you know, a longtime friend, you're supposed to feel a certain way. I understand that, that feeling of guilt. Um, that's something that I struggle with too, but I think maybe just you, you know what your relationship with the person was. You can't force yourself to feel something you don't feel just because you're blood. So I think maybe you, you forgive yourself and you also work on forgiving him and know that he did the best he could with the life he had. In a situation like that, I think if you didn't have the kind of relationship with this grandfather, which would, would make you feel more for him, because I think that's probably what it was, that for whatever reason you didn't work close to him and he it did not affect you, this death, I think you've just got to accept it. If there's anyone left, like a, a grandmother or an aunt or someone that you feel might have been hurt by this, you might try to contact them, write them a note, and say you have been thinking about him. Okay, this is one that's not advice, it's just a question. What's the number one thing to do on your bucket list? Ooh, I'd like to write something, but I'm too afraid. But I want to not be so afraid anymore. I would really like to write something. I don't know whether that's a book or a screenplay or something, but I would I would like to write. You'd be really good at it. I mean, Lena, you have to say that because I'm on your podcast. <laughs> the number one thing to do on my bucket list is go back to Hawaii. Did you love and Hawaii? And we're going. You're going? Yes. That's amazing. Isn't that wonderful. That's perfect. My last question for you is if you could tell all of the women at home listening one piece of advice you wish you'd known when you were in your 20s, what would it be? Break rules. <laughs> Yay. Yay! That was so good, June. <laughs> 
Thank you so much to Emma and June for keeping us company this season of Women of the Hour as our resident advice gurus. I can honestly say I learned a lot from these two. The next lady on today's agenda is artist Lori Simmons, a.k.a. my mom. Okay, so, um, Lori, I'm really excited to finally get you on the podcast. You were actually super hard to book. Oh, that's just silly. It's not silly. We made a lot of contact back and forth with your people, and I've finally gotten you to sit down for this tell-all. It's really my pleasure. Well, thank you, Mom. You know, part of what's been fun about this podcast has been asking questions to women I know that I've never asked them before. And just for a little background... You and I were once having, I'm not going to call it an argument, I'm going to call it a philosophical discussion, and you said to me, you really can't imagine how the things that I've dealt with or how hard things actually were when I was coming up as an artist. And And I thought to myself, oh, of course I know. What are you talking about? I'm a feminist. All I think about is how hard things were for everyone. And then I realized that there were so many pieces of the story of you being a woman my age in with an emerging career that I actually didn't know and understand. Mm. So I was wondering if I could start by asking you a little bit about, firstly, what gave you the audacity, which then gave me the audacity to think that you could be an artist. Well, I never imagined being anything else but an artist. I didn't really think I could do anything else because it was the thing that I'd done since I was a little girl. What's interesting is that now, the age I am, I think I could do anything. I think I could actually finally hold down a job. I could be a great saleswoman in a department store. (laughs) I sometimes feel like I could be a fantastic waitress. These are all things I didn't think I could do when I was in my early 20s. I thought I could only be an artist. And that's that's why I kind of stuck to it and did all of the side crazy jobs that it took for me to pursue being an artist because I really didn't believe I could do anything else. You know, you came from, you know, what we will call here a suburban background where it wasn't like you had tons of examples of women working or like busting open the glass ceiling. I had no examples in front of me of women who worked actually. And I came from a pretty solid middle class background or maybe it was slightly middle class class veering towards upper middle class because none of the women worked. Um, So there really were no examples around me. Considering there were no examples around you, like when you set out to be an artist, what were you visualizing for yourself and how did you model that for yourself? I visualized whatever my idea of a bohemian life was. And as you know, my father, your grandfather was a dentist and he was my dentist. So he used to... um, hold me captive in his dental chair and he told me that if I didn't get married and I was an artist that I would probably live in a in what he called a cold water flat a walk up <laughs> he sort of outlined the life that I would have if I chose to be an artist and chose not to get married and it actually compared to my suburban background it sounded he didn't realize how glamorous he made it sound. And I thought, oh, big deal, not having hot water. If that's, if that's the least of it, I can deal with that. Also, why did he assume that you weren't going to be able to get married if you were an artist? He couldn't reconcile the idea of a woman having a career and also being married. He couldn't quite picture that. But the audacity you talk about, I'm really amazed by the audacity that a lot of younger women have that they don't even know they have. I mean, in hindsight, I think, what was I thinking? But when you're in the middle of it, your audacity is almost all you have to live on. That's your food and lodging, your audacity, you know? Well, it's so interesting because you're, whenever anyone asks you, like, what made you think you could be a filmmaker? What made you think you could just start these various, you know, projects? What made you think you could have a podcast? I always point to you and the sense that in your life and in your career, you didn't seem to sense any boundaries for yourself. But unlike me, you weren't raised by you. Sometimes I wonder if the obstacles that my parents threw up for me actually ended up helping me in some way or making me more, to use the word again, audacious. And I did think about it. I thought about it with you and your sister. I thought, God, you guys are getting an awful lot of support here. What's that going to do? Is it going to backfire? Is it going to be, quote unquote, supportive? There was so much resistance to me 
and kind of such a lack of support that I vowed if I had children, specifically if I had daughters, that I was going to try to come up with a level of support that I'd never had, you know, try to try to do something a bit more supportive. I think you did great. Thank you. That's music to my ears. Once you got to the art world, you were full of this like vim and vigor and you found yourself squarely in the New York art world of the 1970s as a young woman who was pursuing photography, which wasn't like the chosen medium at the time. No. Can you tell me about the moment that you realized like, holy shit, being a woman in this situation is not the easiest thing in the world or whether that moment happened? I remember feeling like women artists in the generation before me who had done so much to open doors for us, for my generation of women, I remember thinking that, gosh, what is wrong with them that they all want to hang out together and they want to have shows with each other and they want to be part of a woman-only thing. I felt fiercely competitive with the men around me. And I feel like that was one change and that's what the generation before me made possible. They made it possible for me to even be able to have feelings of competition with the men around me. And for that, I'm really grateful. Though at the time, I I was kind of rejecting them. And that's why I really understand what younger women have to do with older groups of women. Sometimes it's really important for them to reject them and everything they believe in in order for them to get to the next place. So I do have a lot of sympathy for generations, you know, that precede me and also the generations after me. But I do remember feeling super, super competitive and thinking, I want to hang on the wall next to these big guy dude painters. I feel like that's my right. And at the time, I was making really tiny photographs, and I thought, well, one way to do that, I think I'm going to make giant photographs that can hang on the wall next to these giant paintings. I think back on the way that my mind worked, and I think of myself like kind of a one-cell organism, like an amoeba who's having these thoughts that are like thought bubbles, and thinking, I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to do that. And it all seems so simplistic when I you know, remember what I was thinking at the time. That's so interesting. And I wondered if, if you ever felt like, because you said you felt fiercely competitive with the men, and that's something that I have definitely inherited from you. There's no part of me that doesn't feel like I want to be in there duking it out and get, you know, for the same slots. And I wondered if there, you ever had the feeling that you had to like make a choice or anyone had to make a choice between like being the sexy, fun girlfriend person and being the competitive hang on the wall next to you person, or if those things could all exist at once at that point. You know, to answer that honestly, since I was never the sexy, fun girlfriend type, there there wasn't really a choice I was making. I was sort of the outspoken artist girl who couldn't really suffer fools, and that's what I was, and I couldn't seem to change that even if I tried, you know? You know, I wasn't a gentle creature. Just so you know, I'm much gentler now than I was then. I know. Dad always talks about it. He was like, she wasn't that easy to bring to a party. I'm so much more patient and accepting of people now than I was then. But that's all part of the process of getting from one place to another, I think, in hindsight. He said you and your friends were always in a fight with someone. It's true. It's almost like you had to have an enemy to feel alive. You had to feel like there was an enemy group in order to feel necessary or vital or vibrant. It, it really was a different position. But that's also part of being young. I think it's really part of being young to feel that kind of anger and to feel that kind of, to feel like you're really alive. And, you know, you have to really name what and who you are. Like deciding that I was a photographer, it seems so silly now, but um, naming myself, calling myself a photographer was really a big deal because I was saying, look, I'm not a sculptor, I'm not a painter, I'm not a filmmaker, I'm a photographer. What I really love so much about young artists now is that they kind of have a fluidity. They can go between drawing and painting and photography and writing and feel like it's all part of one piece. But back then, it was really sort of important to to cite and name your medium. You know, it was just like, it was a big deal to say, I'm a woman and I'm not a painter. I'm not a sculptor. This is what I do. It's kind of a lot like gender is now. You know, back then, it was really important to say, 
I'm a heterosexual, I'm a homosexual, I'm a feminist. And I just love the fluidity that exists now. I just love the way it's not as important to define who you are. That, to me, seems just like such a huge step in such a positive direction. And I'm inspired by it, and it makes me think that I can do other things like make movies, even though I called myself a still photographer. Now, here's a question. We, we, you know, so many incidences that I see of misogyny in my day-to-day life are veiled in some way because of the fact that, like, at this point, men are, smart men are kind of keeping their overtly misogynistic talk to the locker room and then, you know, just doing things in a way more, it's still there, but they're trying to, like, veil it in, not be quite as, um, overt the same way that like people understand now that overt racism is problematic Mm -hmm. but they still display racism in all kinds of subtle ways like the same exists with like homophobia or gender discrimination and I wondered if when you were first in the art scene whether you were still seeing incidences of like overt misogyny directed at young female artists if there was any like get off our block kind of feeling like whether that was the vibe. I probably, if I thought about it, had so many stories. But one that came to mind was after after you were born, there was a male artist who said to me, unsolicited, maybe you should join a gallery that's sympathetic to women who have children. And I was like, uh, excuse me? What would that even mean? You know, I'm still scratching my head about that one. And there was another guy, a writer, who I still won't talk to to this day, who said, you know, Lori Simmons' work was much stronger before she had a child. That's so crazy. <laughs> As though something really powerful within the creative soul of a woman artist would be destroyed by the, you know, birth of a child. So I feel like there's a there there's a sense, not with men, you know, Marlon Brando had like 14 children. (laughs) Yeah, Picasso fathered like everyone's child. Like he's probably my father. In this case, I'm going to have to disagree. But but this sense that that um, it, it might be destructive to a woman artist to actually have a child or think about being part of a family or, you know, it's crazy. It's really crazy. And speaking of having children, once you had success, your parents who were so flummoxed by the idea of what you were going to do, do you feel like they started to be proud or understand? Yes. My mother started keeping a scrapbook of articles. She used to do this thing that really made me crazy. Every time a show opened, she would call me and say, when are the reviews coming out? And I'd have to say, Mom, it is not guaranteed that I get a review in the New York Times or Vogue or, you know, the New York Observer. And I'd have to explain to her anew every single time I had a show that there was no guarantee of a review. And she was just waiting with her scissors (laughs) because she just wanted to cut things out and put them in her scrapbook. Do you think she cut out bad reviews? I don't know if she could tell the difference. I actually, and I'm really not trying to insult my dear mother, but I actually don't think she really paid attention to the difference between a negative review and a positive review. It was all ink to her, and all ink was positive. And maybe that is a great attitude, you know? Yeah, totally. She had an all press is good press attitude about you. She had an all press is good press attitude. I remember her scrapbook and seeing pictures of you and dad inside her in newspapers inside her scrapbook. It was the only place I really got the information that you were even in newspapers. She really was uh, pretty, pretty great about that. She kept it on her coffee table next to the hard candies. That's true. I asked her once if she had expected me to do what I was doing or if she'd had any idea that it would go this way. And she said, you know, I really thought that you would marry a doctor or a lawyer and um, show your art at the synagogue art shows. Because when I grew up, the local uh, temple hosted an art show every year, and that's when the Sunday painters or the, the ladies who made art put their work in the show. And it was a really cool thing, and I went to see it. And, it, you know, to me as a little kid, it was pretty inspiring. But I think that my mother couldn't visualize anything beyond that. That's yeah. what she could see. And that's okay. That was her reality. Yeah. You and I were talking the other day, and this is sort of the last area that I wanted to hit. We were talking about the fact that so many young women think to themselves, like, you know, 
this is the really hard period of my life. This is the period where I'm going to feel tortured and I'm going to have kids get older and suddenly like everything is just going to be water off my back, water off a duck's back. Like I'm not going to have the same kind of torture and energy around my work, around success, around all of it. And you know, something I've really witnessed with you is like, I'm not going to say torture, but you continue to challenge yourself and you continue to feel deeply when things don't go the way you want them to. You're like in an extremely alive relationship with your career and with your the way your work is received publicly and with trying new things. And I wondered if you could speak to that a little bit. You know, I'm 66 years old and I thought at this point, if things went well, you'd be kind of like, a uh, high flying bird, you know, like nothing would yeah. bother you, nothing would touch you. But I think it's really important to know that it is possible to feel disappointment. It is possible to feel rejection. And what changes is the recovery time or the ability to be able to talk yourself out of it. But it's always there. And, you know, I talked to someone the other day who I consider to be a very a very wise old man, and I was kind of talking to him about some ways that I'd felt disappointed and how leveled I felt and how surprised I was to still feel this way. And he said, you know, it's amazing at your age that you're still so aspirational, that you still feel engaged, and that you're still able to feel these disappointments. A lot of people are just packing it in. And my first thought was, whoa, Packing it in at my age? Are you kidding? How could anyone feel like packing it in? And then I thought, well, maybe it is an indicator that I still have goals and I still have aspirations and there are still places that I want to go. So maybe that's a new way not to feel bad, to still feel like you're in the game and you're thinking about things and you're reacting to things. And that means that it's possible to feel both elated and totally bummed out. Yeah. I have one last question for you, which my last one for you, I haven't asked you this in like 10 years. Are you scared to die? You know, I was just thinking about that yesterday, but that's not a unique thing for me to think about because I think I've thought about dying every single day of my life since I've learned what dying is. And um, some days are different than other days. Some days I feel more prepared. Some days I feel less prepared. It's interesting the days that I feel like I have so much left to do, like I have to make this body of work, I want to make this movie, I want to meet my grandchildren, hint, hint. <sighs> the days that I feel like there's so much left to do, those are the days that I feel more scared about the end approaching because I just think, God, there's so much to do. But then there's another place I can go where I think that all people die. It's just the next thing ahead of us it's part of everybody's reality and everybody's adventure, then I can kind of calm myself down. So I don't know. I'd like to answer that question again in 20 or 30 years. How about that? You're not going to die soon. It's, when you said the end approaching, I was like, I didn't mean it was approaching, Mom. No, no, I know. But everybody thinks about the end approaching. I mean, Of course. You know. I think about it every day. Yeah. Also, you're the person who told me that reincarnation exists, and it really helped me a lot. I'm, I just decided because you're my mom, I had to listen to you. I mean, that's a whole other podcast, the reincarnation <laughs> podcast. I know. You can Let's host... set that one up. Let's do it. <laughs> mom, thank you so much for having this dialogue okay. with can me. Can I say one more thing before we go? Yeah. I am really proud of you. Mom. <laughs> it's true. That's so nice. Well, That's so true. nice. I have to get it into our podcast. She's not the kind of mom, like, I know she's proud of me, but she's not the kind of mom who says that every single day, right, mom? No, but I'd say it. I'm so proud of you, and I really love you. I'm really proud of you, too, to tell you the honest truth, and I really love you, and I brag about you a lot. This has been really fun. It's been really fun, mom. I love you so much. Next, we asked different women what they would say to someone who's gone from their lives and to tell us how they've been changed by loss and grief. My name is Augusta Folletta. Uh, my name is Rosalind Warren. I lost my older brother, Tim. My mother passed away when I was 16, and my father passed away when I was 21. My name is Liesl Spitz. I'm 28 years old. I'm 26. I don't know why I thought I was 28. The person I'm about to talk about was 28 when she died. 
my cousin Tiffany. My name's Summer Ann Burton, and um, four years ago, my friend Esme was murdered in her home in Austin, Texas. My name is Julia Furlan, um, or Julia Fudlan. I lost my grandmother. Hi, my name is Keisha Bari. My grandfather died, and I wanted to talk about him because I miss him the most. My name is Sister Alice Wheeler. I'm a sister of St. Joseph for 68 years. Even though my mother died very young, I still have strong feelings about the loss. When I meet other people that have experienced loss, there's an instant knowingness um, and bond that um, you have with someone that really knows what you're going through because it's something that is completely life-changing. It's something that you're not born with or, um, you know, like a lot of other things, it's, it happens to you. And so there's just this different feeling about it. At the beginning, when it was first happening and it was first sinking in, I just felt like completely numb, but also completely tense. Just a like a gut punch, <laughs> um, just physically draining. I would try, okay, I would be trying to tie my shoes and I would say, I need 10 minutes to do this. Normally I would give myself one, but I need 10. And then I would look up and 20 minutes had passed and I had no idea how it happened. With Esme, I felt like I couldn't think about her being who she was and the like super positive, sweet, funny person she was, and then like actually force myself to think about like her being murdered and in order to like feel all the things that I would need to feel to have that release. It just seems like something I need to like stay away from. It was so little by little that I lost her that it didn't feel like that you know, big foot stepping on your chest. It, it was just, it was like light. I feel tight in my chest, for sure. When something means a lot to me, I think heartache is real. It's never gonna go away. For some reason, it's one of those few emotions that just stays that same heightened feeling. Grieving is good. Uh, crying is good. A woman is at her best when she is crying. She's her truest self. Next question. I think if my parents were still alive, one thing would be to ask everything that I didn't get to ask when they were alive. So everything about, you know, how did they first feel when they first fell in love or, um, what, you know, what is, what's the most uh, the proudest moment of their life and all those things that you can't get. And I think the second half, would be I would want to tell them um, everything that I had achieved since then. So it would just be like a little mental checklist that I would be like, by the way, so <laughs> the last nine years <laughs> I've been doing this. Sometimes the hardest part of this is like, he would have known what to say. And um, he walked through so much depression and like so many hard times where now I'm like, oh my God, I can't believe like, A, I don't know what the fuck I'm doing. And B, like you were the only one in the family who would have been able to help me with this or like you would have understood. If I knew that it was my last conversation with her, I don't know, that's too impossible. I would probably just tell her I love her. I mean, what else could I say? If I, if I knew that her life would end this way, I would have told her to stop worrying so much because she worried so much about anything. She was sort of an anxious person and also so compassionate in the way that those two qualities can kind of bleed into each other of being so concerned for other people, overly so. And then she died in like one second. So it's like, you don't need to worry. You know, this moment is enough. I mean, that's something that I have taken out of this as well. I sometimes like make mixes that are basically like this is all the music that you've missed while you've been gone <laughs> um and then boys like who do I have a crush on you can't really go to a bar with your coworkers and be like check out this photo of this cute guy but Esme would have totally been down for that and I feel like I could have just been like look here's like his Facebook photo like what do you think I missed that 
What do I want her to know about me? I want her to know that I'm like a responsible person who has all my shit together. (laughs) Because I think that's what she respects. I remember him telling me before I left to go traveling, he was like, why do you want to go see the world for? There's nothing out there because he was so disillusioned after World War Two. But I can, I think that um, the conversation will be like, see, no, no, like, you know, it's not all bad. Like, you know, I've got, I've got some travel under my belt. Um, you know, my the world is far more open and I've grown as a person. And I think that our conversation will be far more adult. And, and um, I think he would really enjoy it, actually. I would like to see him be proud of me and what I've accomplished on my own. I have a a strong feeling that my mother was always present in my life, even though she passed. When I cook a meal, I keep saying, don't let this burn. You never taught me uh, how to cook. And I have a, a, had a brother who will never ate spaghetti after uh, I lost my mother because all I did was cook spaghetti. (laughs) And he didn't like it for the rest of his life. Oh, I want her to know that I'm in love, not just with my partner, but with my life and with everything. You know, that I have love. And I, oh God, I'm so close with my cousins. I'm, you know, my family is really important to me. I think she would be really happy. There's always that feeling of everything that you wish you could have said or done and I think yeah my biggest insight would be to not let those opportunities pass by listening to these women talk so beautifully about grief made me think about my grandmother so I'm going to tell you a little bit about her now my grandmother died when I was 13 right after Y2K which we had all really hoarded for And um, she was my best friend. That's not just like a, you know, kitschy, cute thing to say. She really was my best friend. We talked on the phone for two hours every afternoon. She was a really radical woman. She had not gotten married until she was 35, which back then was like getting married when you were like 87. And she had been a nurse in World War II, um, a public health worker, a real estate agent. She had a number of lives and a really progressive attitude and I think had she been born now, she would have lived a really, really different life. And there are so many times that I just want to reach out to her and just say, like, Grandma, look, all these things that you wanted to do, like wear pants and hang out with gay dudes all the time and live in the city by yourself and say fuck it to certain societal conventions. I get to do that. And unless I remember you, I forget to appreciate it. And um, I have this recurring dream where... I go to my grandma's house just to look in, and it turns out she's still alive. Like, she's been there for the last 15 years, but she's, you know, a little out of it, and no one's been taking care of her properly, and nobody's been, um, you know, feeding her or washing her pajamas. And I can't believe that I've lost this time with her, and that dream is always the moment when I have to remember, like, that I'm living this life because of the one that she had. The one time I took mushrooms, I felt this strong sense, like, I'm connected to every woman who has ever come before me, and I've never felt that more strongly than when I looked at my grandmother and understood how much she had sacrificed because of what was expected of her, but how much she also knew that that was wrong. And so um, I love her. I feel lucky for her. Next, we brought back my stunning noodle of a friend, Miranda July, and asked her a bit about parenthood. I always knew I wanted to have a kid, but I definitely put it off. And once I was with someone who was like, great, let's have one now, I was like, oh, I I mean... What? (laughs) Like, I'd have so much I need to do first. Um, And I literally did have a to-do list. Um, At very least, I wanted to have made two movies because I felt like if you've only made one, then you really might never make one again. Like, the statistics are, I think, 
um, indicate that for women directors. So I, I needed to have made two. And after I had, I, I got pregnant and, um, my big fear was, was that I would never make art again or that the part of me that wanted to would just kind of dissipate and that, you know, some part of myself that I didn't know about would come to the fore and the, you know, this great love. Um, and, and that scared me because I was like the dissolution of my whole identity and, and, you know, and then I also just feared practically, like, how would I do that if I couldn't, you know, work 24 hours a day and it's strange what happens I've never been so fired up to work as I was like in the hospital after I'd had my child and that was because I was thrown into the very marrow of life and death and it's so terrifying and so incredibly filled with feeling and if you've spent your whole life dealing with feelings by making art, you're just like, oh my God, this is the feeling to beat all feelings. And I'm, I, is, can I write on that? Is that a business card? <laughs> Do you mind if I just write a few things down on that? Um, and I literally have like the card from the hospital. I have it taped above my desk and it's just crammed full with like little things and dreams. And, you know, I was just having the most insane dreams and, that kept on being true. It wasn't just that day. It wasn't just the beginning. Um, it's your every day you're plunged into a world of, of feeling and not just ideas about time and like life itself, but like an actual experience of it. As an artist, you know, the, the real fear is that you'll, you won't have enough feelings. Like you won't have material like that's what would stop you having a child is is the opposite you have plenty of feelings and then the the flip side is also true like now you're a waitress and a cleaning person and you're exhausted and you don't want to do anything but just lie there alone watching something really dumb Now I'm going to talk to my amazing friend Mariana Polka. Mariana is a beautiful artist, filmmaker, and actor with a thrilling Scottish accent. She put out a documentary last year called The Lion's Mouth Opens about Huntington's disease, which runs in her family. Huntington's is a terrible and slow-progressing illness. It's highly genetic, and Mariana's father has the disease. She'll tell us about the experience of making the film and how it changed her life. Warning, she's a very enlightened human. I had this real need at the time to figure out whether, because I had Huntington's disease in my family, I wanted to get tested for the gene. And I thought of making a documentary as kind of a an abstract concept. The, the primary thing that I was thinking about at the time was my own life. But then yeah. it's a very short documentary. And at the end of the documentary, you see me getting the result. How would you describe Huntington's disease to a person who didn't have any idea what it was. People describe it as a cross between Parkinson's and Alzheimer's because it affects your body and your brain at the same time. So your nervous system is essentially rotting. Um, it's it's really hard if you look at a healthy brain and then you look of if you look at a brain of someone who is showing symptoms of Huntington's disease or in the late stages, their brain just isn't there anymore. So it's like a rotting of the mind. Yeah, it's not fun. There's nothing really funny about it. I've been trying to like, I, I like to make jokes about it a lot and like not very many people laugh. Like it's only like my really close friends that are like, ha ha! And like everyone else is like, oh God. How old were you when your father was diagnosed? He was you? diagnosed when I was eight. And that's when we understood that it runs in families and that there's a test for it and all these things that we actually went to a counselor for as a family and it was a really interesting thing to 
experience as an eight-year-old because up until that point I had just been living in this fantasy happy family vibe of just having my mom and dad be amazing and us go on these amazing vacations and we had such a great time that that was kind of like the beginning of my loss of innocence as a person I feel like. That's the thing about the film is that you look and I'm getting chills talking about this like you look right down the barrel of something that for so many people is impossible to imagine and you just say like either way my life is going to be beautiful and I think you know knowing you that it was sort of both the turning point for you personally and artistically to sort of take that step and like let the world see that thing you had been so afraid of clearly the last two years of your life has it been two years since that yeah the last two years of your life have been beautiful and full of positivity and travel and magic and humor and I wondered whether that felt like that was something new to you whether you felt like there was a huge shift in your life based on making the film based on the diagnosis based on the reception of the film or whether you're just continuing to build on what it was before what was that shift like well I think when you go into a pain wave like that when it's coming and you can see that like oh my goodness this is going to be really treacherous I think that when you share that with your friends and you can figure out in your community like how to actually not be alone in it and and find a way to go under the wave or around it um, or ride it you know I think there's something kind of miraculous about that and I think that what happened was really profoundly you know like the worst thing that could have happened I guess you know like there's so much to be said for for the things that we feel that way about as people and I think since then it's become even more so it's been more joy and more love and more laughs like you were saying I take nothing for granted you know I just think that life is so beautiful and that's why I'm never trying to to change anything you know like I think there's something quite spiritual about that like just accepting what is and and being comfortable with with that and and pushing forward in spite and because of everything that's hard and not pushing away people who in society we think oh those are the sick people or those are the people who aren't supposed to be talked about or we're not supposed to talk about you know anything that that people kind of shove under the carpet I find really fascinating and I feel like those are the things that that actually should be coming out and we should be making movies about and TV shows about. Well, something you did in that doc is you showed footage of people with Huntington's disease who have essentially been hidden away from... From the society. Yeah. Yeah. And I think something your film did besides show an example of a really beautifully brave woman was the idea that it's like, actually, these are the things that we have to see in order to have a full picture of what Mm -hmm. life is. Yeah. And they're not the things to be shunned they're actually the things that we can find freedom within that was the lovely mariana polka this is lena's corner and we are here in our final installment to talk about an incredibly inspiring figure francesca whitman Francesca Woodman got a camera at 13, and she didn't stop taking photographs until her death at 22. Today I came home from Newport seething with ideas and a new hat, she wrote while attending boarding school. By the time she showed up at Rhode Island School of Design for college, her intensity, focus, and skill intimidated classmates. She seemed to have been born in the wrong century. She was totally outside pop culture. She never watched TV. She couldn't have cared less about music, one of her college friends said, adding, but if she wanted something, she was going to get it. She loves surrealism, Victorian heroines, and myths. Her photographs concealed, flattened, or distorted the female form, often her own. Far from conventional self-portraits, Francesca's naked figure was blurred through long exposure times, rendering her ghostly and ethereal. Woodman would do whatever was necessary to get her shot. When she wanted to pose in an Italian museum, she befriended a guard who agreed to let her in after hours. Sensing the guard's romantic interest, Francesca brought along her mom. As Betty Woodman explained, I had to sit in a room outside, but if she squawked or sounded like she needed help, I was to go right in. Her father, George Woodman, added, What she means is, if the guard pinched her bottom, Betty would be there. After college, Francesca moved to New York, hoping to make it big. But the kind of recognition and fame she sought didn't come until after her death. Though colored by her struggle with depression and the suicidal urges that ultimately took her life, The photos Francesca produced speak to her unique sense of humor. 
Witty and unsettling, the hundreds and hundreds of photographs she took have found homes and museums around the world. Francesca would definitely be pleased, though never satisfied. You surely remember the unforgettable Ashley Ford from episode one. She's the greatest radio voice, but also a really nice face. We started the first show with her, and then we'll close the final show with a story about her grandmother. My grandma, when she was alive, you know, my mom told her, Ashley's got some friend and she's on TV. (laughs) And my grandma was like, what do you mean Ashley's on TV? And my mom was like, no, her friend is on TV. (laughs) Um, Her name's Lena Dunham. And my grandma, who traditionally was pretty um, famous people, celebrity obsessed, right? Like she taught me to read using the Bible and celebrity tabloids. (laughs) Um, so she would ask me about, you know, how's how's Brett? Have you talked to Brett? Or And then she'd always say, and how's your, your star friend? How's the star? Because <laughs> that's how she called all, you know, like um, celebrity people. Everybody was just, they were all stars. And so she's like, how's the star? And I would be like, she's great. She's, you know, she's filming or she's doing this or whatever. And, you know, a lot of times it was just like, she's just hanging out, <laughs> you know. She's just um, chilling. She's just chilling, Grandma. So my grandma... Right before I moved to New York, she uh, was diagnosed with cancer and told that it was, you know, it was terminal. So I moved, but we talked all the time. And, you know, and every time she called, I don't know, maybe she just had it in her head that, like, I lived with Lena or something. But whenever she called, she would always be like, is your star friend around? Tell her I said hi. (laughs) And I would be like, okay. (laughs) You know, we were so close, um, me and my grandma. And I was lost. Like, I was very very lost when she passed and more than once you showed up for me in a a really real and really um affirming way and that was one of the times in our friendship that it was easiest for me to just allow you to be a good friend and be there for me and to be there for me in a way that I would have you know hoped that you know I could have been for you had the situations been reversed, been reversed. So, so much of friendship, especially like millennial friendship, I feel to throw around a word I hate is like founded <laughs> on people sort of the illusion of people being present for each other because it's like we're in each other's Twitter feeds and we're in each other's text messages. And we're in each other's Facebook feeds. But like, who are you actually going to call when the shit hits the fan? And it's a really confusing thing. And there's this feeling you can have where you're like, I'm surrounded by people and I'm totally alone. That's mm-hmm. like another thing. That's a New York feeling too. And to know <laughs> yeah. that there's somebody where you can express like, this is really bad. And they're not going to respond with like a, you know, bitmoji, but they're going to really like let you know that they get it. And mm-hmm. that is something that you showed me really early on. And all I could do was just try to mimic you when <laughs> it came to your grandma passing away. After my grandma passed... And I went back for the funeral and things. I um, There were a couple of, like, costume jewelry type things that she had um, and different, like, sweaters and stuff that I liked that I ended up bringing back with me to New York. And I specifically picked out a very um, specific pin for Lena that my grandma used to wear sometimes to church, and it was in the shape of a star. And I brought that back for her because she was not just helpful she was sort of like she was so guiding in the moments um when I was having a really hard time dealing and I knew that when she you know helped me in those moments it was because she loved me but in a way it was also because like she loved my grandma and she loved my grandma because my grandma had loved me so well so I wanted to give her something that sort of like represented that relationship um and how thankful I was. And so I brought back that little star pin for her and gave it to her over breakfast. And it was the best. It was a really, really, really lovely moment. And I wear it on special days. I have it sitting in my most special padded part of my drawer. And I love yeah. it's next to all the things that might, because you know, I had a really 
different but powerful relationship with my grandma and it's mm-hmm. next to all of her things and I felt like that was something immediately reading your writing and hearing the way that you like gave your grandma this real voice like she was a person to you she wasn't an old person she was a no. person and it's a really unusual special thing and also your impressions of her like I think everybody who knows <laughs> you feels like they know her just purely because of the Billy Cole's impressions mm-hmm. and it's really that's like one of that was really special yeah I love you Ashley I love you too <laughs> <laughs> sorry Bring it home. We're bringing it home. I know the grandma yeah, stories, like, the grandma's oh, stuff right. gets me every time. Thank you for doing this with me. Dear listeners, the time has come to say goodbye, at least for now. This podcast was originally conceived as a mini series. Five installments to focus on the five topics I explored in my book, now out in paperback in time for the holidays. Only this time we want to do it through a kaleidoscopic lens of many women, many truths, and many histories. That mission has been a thousand times more gratifying than we could have ever imagined, both in the way it educated us and in the way it drew listeners together. We now find ourselves wanting to make more, more, more. It's no secret that I have a day job, occasionally flashing my tits on TV, but this podcasting thing is pretty darn addictive, like Miracle Whip or Vicodin or a new friendship with the coolest girl in high school. Thank you for making it that way, for the love and support and curiosity. Thank you for giving us a lot of hope and peace. So let's not treat this like a goodbye, but rather a catch you later, sis. Until then, all love to the great Gaia Force and don't sweat the small stuff. Sincerely, Women of the Hour. I've had so much more than a good time It's meant so much more to me But I don't know if I'll ever fit inside Who you want me to be And I won't play the game I'm not Erica Kane I mean what I say And I say Thanks so much for listening to this show. I've been a lot of places, seen a lot of faces, and now I'm a podcaster, and no one can take that away from me. Than before. And just for a little background, you and I were once having, I'm not going to call it an argument, I'm going to call it a philosophical discussion, and you said to me, you really can't imagine how the things that I've dealt with or how hard things actually were when I was coming up as an artist and I re- and I thought to myself oh of course I know what are you talking about I'm a feminist all I think about is how hard things were for everyone and then I realized that there were so many pieces of the story of you being a woman my age in with an emerging career that I actually didn't know and understand mm. so I was wondering if I could start by asking you a little bit about firstly what gave you the audacity, which then gave me the audacity to think that you could be an artist. Well, I never imagined being anything else but an artist. I didn't really think I could do anything else because it was the thing that I'd done since I was a little girl. What's interesting is that now, the age I am, I think I could do anything. I think I could actually finally hold down a job. I could be a great saleswoman in a department store. (laughs) I sometimes feel like I could be a fantastic waitress. These are all things I didn't think I could do 
when I was in my early 20s. I thought I could only be an artist. And that's why, that's why I kind of stuck to it and did all of the side crazy jobs that it took for me to pursue being an artist because I really didn't believe I could do anything else. You know, you came from, you know, what we will call here a suburban background where it wasn't like you had tons of examples of women working or like busting open the glass ceiling. I had no examples in front of me of women who worked actually. And I came from a pretty solid middle class background or maybe it was slightly middle class veering towards upper middle class because none of the women worked. Um, so there really were no examples around me. Considering there were no examples around you, like when you set out to be an artist, what were you visualizing for yourself and how did you model that for yourself? I visualized whatever my idea of a bohemian life was. And as you know, my father, your grandfather was a dentist and he was my dentist. So he used to um, hold me captive in his dental chair and he told me, that if I didn't get married and I was an artist, that I would probably live in a, in what he called a cold water flat, a walk up. <laughs> he sort of outlined the life that I would have if I chose to be an artist and chose not to get married. And it actually, compared to my suburban background, it sounded, he didn't realize how glamorous he made it sound. And I thought, oh, big deal, not having hot water. If that's, if that's the least of it, I can deal with that. Also, why did he assume that you weren't going to be able to get married if you were an artist? He couldn't reconcile the idea of a woman having a career and also being married. He couldn't quite picture that. But the audacity you talk about, I'm really amazed by the audacity that a lot of younger women have that they don't even know they have. I mean, in hindsight, I think, what was I thinking? But when you're in the middle of it, your audacity is almost all you have to live on. That's your food and lodging, your audacity, you know? Well, it's so interesting because you're, whenever anyone asks you, like, what made you think you could be a filmmaker? What made you think you could just start these various, you know, projects? What made you... When I was writing my book, most of the essays fit into clear territories. Sex, love, work, friendship. But then there are those subjects, vague but just as essential. Death, illness, mental health, the paranormal right and wrong and good and bad. If your brain were a pie chart, this is the stuff that might not find a neat slice to settle itself into, but it's also the stuff that keeps you up at night, is impossible to explain, and makes you the complex and universally attuned individual you are. Welcome to the big picture. I want to be a, pedi a pediatrician, at the same time, I want to be a, a veterinarian, and then I also want to be a painter, but I also want to be like um, a curandera, which is like a healer with like natural plants. But then I was, all, I was also thinking of, of being a, a marine biologist, maybe, or like a person who studies like, like strong diseases and how to cure them. Lupita Martinez is 11 years old. Not only does she have a lot of badass ideas about what she wants to be when she grows up, but she's already making a huge difference in her community in East Oakland, California. Her unofficial scouting troop, the Radical Monarchs, never even considered selling cookies. Instead, they're forging relationships in their community in radical new ways. One of my favorite parts of being a Radical Monarch is just building a lot of relationships with my with, with my radical monarch sisters and just learning with them is just like really fun. Hi, my name is Lupita and I'm in sixth grade and I'm 11 years old and I'm a part of the radical monarchs. Oh yeah, my mom started the group. She was, you know, at the end of her fourth grade year and really kind of like I saw her kind of grappling with like issues of her own identity. Like what does it mean for her to be this like young brown girl of color? So my name is Anevet Martinez and I am one of the co-founders of the radical monarchs. And so I started to think about what would it look like to start a group that centered her identity and that still had some of the components of like scouting troops, right, where they earn badges. But instead of earning badges for volunteering, like maybe at like a dog shelter, it was more based on social justice, like radical actions, like marches and um, learning about, you know, issues around identity and social justice. And so I um, asked one of my best friends, Marilyn, 
she has an extensive background with like youth development and youth work and so I was kind of like I have this idea what do you think and she was like yes we need this I wish I would have had it when are we going to do it let's do it my name is Marilyn Hollenquist and I am one of the co-founders of the Radical Monarchs we hadn't seen anything that was social justice focused in an explicit way in an unapologetic like we're here we're earning like our radical pride badges or our pachamama justice badges we're constantly thinking about like so who do we need to bring in like who's whose voices do they not hear enough of and who do they get like who do they hear about all the time one of my favorite activities we went to trans march and we were allies to the ELA group, which is um, an organization for trans Latinas. And we were being allies to them. We were marching with them. And I thought it was really fun supporting them and yelling into the big man. Thanks to Katie J.M. Baker for initially reaching out to the Monarchs and coming up with some excellent questions. This episode is all about the big stuff, life writ large, and in keeping with that theme, Emma Stone and June Squibb, our trusted advisors, are here to share their answers to your toughest questions about friendship, relationships, work, bodies, and bucket lists. My grandfather passed a year ago. I never got along with him, so I wasn't saddened by his passing and didn't mourn. I felt guilty then, and I figured it would pass, but I just feel more guilty about not being upset. How do I come to terms with my feelings of guilt? It's hard when you're trying to force yourself to feel an emotion that you don't feel, but because they're family or because they're, you know, a longtime friend, you're supposed to feel a certain way. I understand that, that feeling of guilt. Um, that's something that I struggle with too, but I think maybe just you, you know what your relationship with the person was. You can't force yourself to feel something you don't feel just because you're blood. So I think maybe you, you forgive yourself and you also work on forgiving him and know that he did the best he could with the life he had. In a situation like that, I think if you didn't have the kind of relationship with this grandfather, which would, would make you feel more for him, because I think that's probably what it was, that for whatever reason you didn't work close to him and he it did not affect you, this death, I think you've just got to accept it. If there's anyone left, like a, a grandmother or an aunt or someone that you feel might have been hurt by this, you might try to contact them, write them a note, and say you have been thinking about him. Okay, this is one that's not advice. It's just a question. What's the number one thing to do on your bucket list? Ooh, I'd like to write something, but I'm too afraid. But I want to not be so afraid anymore. I would really like to write something. I don't know whether that's a book or a screenplay or something, but I would I would like to write. You'd be really good at it. I mean, Lena, you have to say that because I'm on your podcast. <laughs> the number one thing to do on my bucket list is go back to Hawaii. Do you love and Hawaii? And we're going. You're going? Yes. That's amazing. That wonderful. That's perfect. My last question for you is if you could tell all of the women at home listening one piece of advice you wish you'd known when you were in your 20s, what would it be? Break rules. <laughs> Yay. Yay! That was so good, June. <laughs> Thank you so much to Emma and June for keeping us company this season of Women of the Hour as our resident advice gurus. I can honestly say I learned a lot from these two. The next lady on today's agenda is artist Lori Simmons, a.k.a. my mom. Okay, so, um, Lori, I'm really excited to finally get you on the podcast. You were actually super hard to book. Oh, that's just silly. It's not silly. It, I, we made a lot of contact back and forth with your people, and I've finally gotten you to sit down for this tell-all. It's really my pleasure. Well, thank you, Mom. You know, part of what's been fun about this podcast has been asking questions to women I know that I've never asked. I go, the megaphone? I said, uh, by accident. <laughs> and it was really loud. My name is Namik Salu. I am 11 years old, and I am a part of the Radical Monarchs. We wrote letters to Nicole. She's a transgender woman in jail, 
And it was fun decorating them because we got to use glitter. A lot of glitter. We tell them, like, when you earn a badge, it's not like, oh, okay, the work here's done. That was fun. It's like it's ongoing and it's, it's all layered. We met some of the members of the Black Panthers. And that was really cool because they gave us our badges and we got to shake their hands. We don't sugarcoat things with our girls, you know, we're very real. And, and I think this troupe was very much informed by like these um, social movements from the past, like the Black Panther Party movement and the Brown Beret movement, the Chicano movement, all these movements. And yet we know that there was also some pitfalls in those movements. And we're very real about that. And so I love that the girls like asked, you know, the Black Panther, like they were like, you know, what was it like to be a woman in the movement? And were there times where you felt like things weren't fair because you're a woman? Because we noticed that like, because we had them watch this video and they're like, we noticed that like there was no, not that many women in the video and the women were always behind the men. And, and you know, and I was like, right, that's right. Let's talk about that. For the Radical Beauty Batch, we also made um, lip balm and it was really fun and it smelled good. You don't have to use makeup or lip gloss or anything fancy with, with chemicals to make you look younger or, or more beautiful. Our second unit was called Radical Beauty and that was all about like what does it mean to be radically beautiful? What does it mean to love yourself radically? You know, something that like we typically may not want to embrace but that makes us beautiful. You can, you're already beautiful and also it's just like some people they just believe that like makeup is the only thing that makes you beautiful but that's not true. Last week we met Betty who is this like 94 year old African American park ranger woman who was um, alive during segregation and um, alive during the uh, Rosie Riveter era and talked a lot about like what that was like. We wanted them to learn about like who are all these other fierce women leaders that have been a, that are movement leaders, right? Um, so that was really powerful. When you're eight and seven, you're like, yes, girl power, it's awesome. And then, and it's really well documented, you know, when you get to that like tween, 11, 12, which is when you kind of start learning the like, oh, okay, it's not, being a girl is not the best thing ever. I just wondered what would it be like if, if all girls could skip that phase of not feeling good enough, not feeling like being a girl is awesome. What would that look like? If someone like recognizes you for something, you're like, what group are you called? You can be proud of saying, oh, I'm a radical monarch. And you could have like confidence in saying it. And I think it's really important also to be um, a radical monarch because communities that need the support from people that like do marches and do stuff with social justice we're supposed to help them and, and I really feel proud of them and also um I just want to say to all my sisters you guys are amazing oh yeah all you guys are like the bomb you can go support the radical monarchs with their fundraising campaign at youcaring.com slash radical dash monarchs. Do you think you could have a podcast? I always point to you and the sense that in your life and in your career, you didn't seem to sense any boundaries for yourself. But unlike me, you weren't raised by you. Sometimes I wonder if the obstacles that my parents threw up for me actually ended up helping me in some way or making me more, to use the word again, audacious. And I did think about it. I thought about it with you and your sister. I thought, God, you guys are getting an awful lot of support here. What's that going to do? Is it going to backfire? Is it going to be, quote unquote, supportive? There was so much resistance to me and kind of such a lack of support that I vowed if I had children, specifically if I had daughters, that I was going to try to come up with a level of support that I'd never had, you know, try to try to do something a bit more supportive. I think you did great. Thank you. That's music to my ears. Once you got to the art world, you were full of this like vim and vigor, and you found yourself squarely in the New York art world of the 1970s as a young woman who was pursuing photography, which wasn't like the chosen medium at the time. No. Can you tell me about the moment that you realized like, holy shit, being a woman in this situation is not the easiest thing in the world or whether that moment happened? I remember feeling like women artists in the generation before me who had done so much to open doors for us, for my generation of women. I remember thinking that, gosh, what is wrong with them that they all want to hang out together and they want to have shows with each other and they want to be part of a woman-only thing? 
I felt fiercely competitive with the men around me. And I feel like that was one change, and that's what the generation before me made possible. They made it possible for me to even be able to have feelings of competition with the men around me. And for that, I'm really grateful. Though at the time, I, I was kind of rejecting them. And that's why I really understand what younger women have to do with older groups of women. Sometimes it's really important for them to reject them and everything they believe in in order for them to get to the next place. So I do have a lot of sympathy for generations you know, that precede me and also the generations after me. But I do remember feeling super, super competitive and thinking, I want to hang on the wall next to these big guy dude painters. I feel like that's my right. And at the time, I was making really tiny photographs, and I thought, well, one way to do that, I think I'm going to make giant photographs that can hang on the wall next to these giant paintings. I think back on the way that my mind worked, and I think of myself like kind of a one-cell organism, like an amoeba, who's having these thoughts that are like thought bubbles, and thinking, I'm going to do this, and then I'm going to do that. And it all seems so simplistic when I you know, remember what I was thinking at the time. That's so interesting. And I wondered if, if you ever felt like, because you said you felt fiercely competitive with the men, and that's something that I have definitely inherited from you. There's no part of me that doesn't feel like I want to be in there duking it out and, get, you know, for the same slots. And I wondered if there, you ever had the feeling that you had to, like, make a choice or anyone had to make a choice between, like, being the sexy, fun girlfriend person and being the competitive hang-on-the-wall-next-to-you person or if those things could all exist at once at that point.